Next on Lectures in History, William Woods University professor Craig Bruce Smith teaches a class about the American Revolution and the Continental Army. He describes how the force differed from the British military in demographics, organizations, and the officer selection process. He also talks about the significance of military operations in the northern colonies. All right, well, welcome, everyone, to another exciting adventure in the history of war. Uh, today, we've gotten to the Continental Army, so uh, welcome to all of you, and welcome to many of our new students watching from who knows where. So happy 40th birthday, C-SPAN. Um, so today, we're going to focus on the Continental Army, and this is, uh, we're, we're situating this very much in the broad history of uh, of war and the military. And the Continental Army, in a lot of ways, is different from other armies that have, have preceded it, largely because it's one that's l very much based on ideals and certain uh, concepts and beliefs rather than sort of your traditional army. Um, so what is the Continental Army? Where is it, first of all? Anyone? America. America, okay. <laughs> so, Continental Army based in America. Um, it will become the first United States Army, but before it is the U.S. Army, it is the Army of America, yes. But what, what element of America? Well, it's certainly part of the American Revolution, specifically. The colonies? The colonies? Yeah, the United Colonies. So, um, when does the Continental Army begin, it's not necessarily with the start of the revolution, but we are going to pick up our story with the beginning of the war. So uh, a couple of classes ago, we were talking about uh, the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War was a world war that fundamentally altered uh, several different nations, but primarily uh, France, removed from the North American continent, Britain, and the British colonies. Um, and many Americans had fought alongside um, British soldiers and British officers during the war. And anyone recall what were some of the things that transpired when the two groups interacted? I mean, the British, they looked down on the colonists. Okay. So in a lot of ways, the British are looking down on the colonists for a, a number of reasons. And that was... Uh, having to do with tactics, having to do with a lack of formal military training. Uh, some of it had to do with how they dressed. So uh, we know there's lots of resistance. There's also a large aspect over who holds the higher rank. So does a colonial officer outrank a British officer? Uh, and we, as we recall, the British officers of lower rank were saying they outranked any colonial officer. And this infuriated a young George Washington. So our story begins after the French and Indian War and the start of the American Revolution. So who wants to give me the, the standard answer? What caused the American Revolution? The Tea Party. Well, that's part of it. <laughs> taxes. And give me the phrase. Taxation without representation. Okay, no taxation without representation. Or if you're like, taxation without representation is tyranny. Perfect. All right. So from there, from taxes, it's, it's also more than that. It's about rights. It's about... Um, uh, being treated as a full subject or a full British uh, subject. And ultimately, it evolves into violence. And this starts after the Tea Party. Uh, there's the Boston Port Bill and a number of what are termed the intolerable acts are going to uh, shut down local government. Uh, it's going to bring in martial law over Boston and Massachusetts. And the British actually start uh, under Thomas Gage, who's general, uh, military governor, starts seizing powder and seizing weapons, leading to increased tension. And this is ultimately going to build to a potential chance to seize gunpowder at the town of Concord, or maybe even arrest Sons of Liberty, leading revolutionary figures who would be Samuel Adams or John Hancock in nearby Lexington. And what results? Hmm. Is this... The shot heard round the world, maybe. Concord also says the shot heard round the world happened in Concord. But anyway, we know that one of the first shots of the American Revolution is fired when the British regulars meet up with colonial militiamen, so from Massachusetts on Lexington Green, and shots are fired. Who fires the first shot? Nobody knows. Exactly. But who did the British say fired? The colonists. The colonists, rebels. <laughs> 
Who do the colonists say fired? Hannah. The British. Oh, good enough. The British. <laughs> Murderers. And it's from this that the war begins. Now, this is initially a militia unit. So, so refreshing, a militia unit was, is basically anyone from the ages of 16 and 60. Uh, they would meet up roughly once a month and drill and train in traditional trappings. Think of like the National Guard today. Um, most American colonists do have some experience with a, with a gun, with a musket, more so than your average British soldier, largely from, from hunting or, or fighting Native Americans. Um, but they don't have necessarily a formal military training of fighting in, in ranks and in, in lines. Shots are fired. Nominally, the colonists lose uh, and, and the British win here. But this is the profound moment that is going to begin the war. And Thomas Jefferson is going to refer to this very specifically. Uh, it's unprovoked murder, an open violation of plighted faith and honor, in defiance of the sacred obligations of treaty, which even savage nations observe. So, so what is Jefferson getting at here? He's saying that like what the British did was like it was just straight up slaughter. Like we didn't really provoke them. Like they just decided to kill us. That even like savages can comprehend that. What okay. They did was terrible. That there's no ethics behind this. This is fundamentally immoral. And he uses this term honor as an ethical idea to say that what the British have done is something that is so barbaric to use, to use a term um, that this is cannot be looked over. This is beyond rights now. This is this is a justification for the war and. We've talked about briefly the idea of a just war principle and, and what makes a war just in, in almost every circumstance. Who first. Yeah, it basically comes down to who attacks who. So the Americans are presenting themselves as a aggrieved party. So they're fighting a defensive war, which means what? They're in the right. They are in the right. Their war is just. Largely based on Everyone's one of the theorists we've read in class, Amir de Vattel, Swiss philosopher, who in his Law of Nations is very much going to cast the correctness or the morality or the honor of a war based on who starts it. So if the British start the war, it justifies American resistance. Meanwhile, we get another battle at Concord Bridge. Name that because it has a bridge. Um, so the Americans are successful at Concord Bridge, even against more trained, skilled British regulars. So why do you think this is? You may remember this from William Wallace, Scottish Rebellion. Howdy. We're at a bridge, though. We have to cross the bridge to fight. OK, so you have to cross the bridge, choke point, meaning numbers don't matter. Don't matter. You have to funnel in. And, the, and this is where you get the quote unquote traditional shot heard around the world, if you believe the 19th century poem. And this is where Americans under orders fire, whereas at Lexington, both sides were under orders not to fire. So when we think of American colonial militiamen fighting, we probably think of the romanticized notion of the minute man. OK, so what is a minute man? Someone who's ready to fight in a minute. OK, so they're going to jump out of bed, fully clothed, put their hat on, grab their musket, and run out, ready to fight. Uh, you know, average musket at the time takes a minute and a half to load, so what's in a name? So the idea is the militiaman is fighting in a regular style, uh, what we call today a guerrilla style, but very much copying the Native American style. And, and why, why did the Americans develop this style as opposed to the British, who were fighting very much in open rank formation as they would in Europe? They had had to defend themselves against the Native people that were living in uh, the Americas when they got there, and so they had to adapt to their tactics, and so they kind of learned from the Indians. Okay, exactly. They have adapt over over centuries, this tactic. Um, also, the British weren't a, um, equipped to fight in that style of warfare, so they would be marching in ranks. Okay, exactly. So we've seen this specifically, if we think back to the French and Indian War, at Braddock's defeat, the Battle of Mongalia, where... A British army is defeated by French and their native allies using the same tactics. They didn't, the British had the higher numbers, so they had to adjust their fighting style okay. to accommodate for that. Okay, so there, there's, a, there's a have to accommodate and adapt to their enemy. Now, the, the 
popular perception on the march back from Concord is this sort of attack from the tree line. You'll see them all down here from hidden positions on the exposed flank, the exposed side of the British army. What's interesting, though, on this long march back, now think about this. The British army is marching back after doing an immediate march at night from Boston to the, uh, the outskirts and then marching back with limited ammunition. They can just be picked off. But what you'll see on this map is you'll see these little explosion marks. And every time you see that, it was actually a moment where there was a pitched battle. So despite the common romanticized element of their hitting, running, hiding behind trees, think like Mel Gibson in The Patriot, um, there are pitched battles along this. But basically, it's going to force the British to retreat to Boston and defend themselves. Uh, ultimately, uh, the British are going to attempt to take fortified colonial positions at Bunker Hill, which, uh, as every trivia fan knows, is actually fought on Breed's Hill. Breed's Hill. Um, the Americans lose but they inflict heavy, heavy casualties. Uh, but still, this is not the Continental Army. These are colonial militia forces. Um, there have been pretty good win-loss ratio. Again, a win at Concord, a forced uh, retreat to Boston, a, a, a pure sort of victory. Um, the idea the British win but lose heavy losses only due to the colonists running out of ammunition. And it's this fighting in Massachusetts that ultimately is going to force a unified response by the colonies. So this question is, is this America's war? Is this Massachusetts war? And a continental army is going to be formed by, what do you guess? Well, he's going to, he's going to head it. But under the Continental Congress, we're going to get George Washington as commander in chief. And he's going to say he's serving uh, based on my country's honor and my own character which is very different than the young Washington we talked about in his, his early 20s, where he actually resigns his commission, and he says, for his own honor and his country's well-being. So it's a fundamental reversal of these roles. And Washington's saying, I am taking this up for duty to the nation, enhancing civilian supremacy. He's saying, I take my orders from Congress. I don't, I don't function as sort of a military dictator. Meanwhile, there's some opposition. And a lot of it comes from this man. His name is Charles Lee. You may remember him from that two-second reference in the Hamilton <laughs> musical. Um, he's a general. We. Oui. <laughs> so Charles Lee, British trained. He'd actually been all around Europe trying to change his ranks, accumulate rank. And he thought he would be one of the people named commander-in-chief. There are others as well. Uh, and Lee, in a lot of respects, is British trained. And he does not think the Americans could win fighting in a traditional European style. And he thinks the Americans should be using this guerrilla, hit-and-run, militia style. In fact, maybe even retreat west and make the British sort of chase them into the hinterlands. Washington is fundamentally opposed to this. And Washington, though he uh, uses multiple styles, is very much trying to fight the war more on a traditional European style. And uh, there are a few reasons why. And one of them is he's concerned with the reputation and how this, re this revolution will be viewed internationally. If they're fighting as other Europeans do, they're fighting in a quote unquote gentlemanly civilized way, it will be respected. If they are not, then they may not gain sort of alliances or support from other nations. Um, and, and so there's this difference of opinion and these two will sort of clash many times throughout uh, the revolution. Um, Ultimately, Washington will prove successful, but that's a, that's a story that's coming. Anyway, Washington is going to take command, and he's going to meet the now Continental Army in Boston uh, late spring 1775. Uh, so this is right after the Battle of Bunker Hill. And at first, the two sides don't get along, particularly the militiamen of Massachusetts. And if you think back when we, we talked about uh, early colonial warfare, the Massachusetts militia, in particular, elects their officers. In Virginia, where Washington's from, they were appointed. So what's the problem with elected officers versus appointed officers in, in, in any sort of fighting for, force? So it's popular. OK, so it's, it, in many times it becomes a popularity contest rather than skill. And people are often unwilling to order their friends in, in, into combat. 
feel like when you're uh, voting on who is going in, I feel like maybe more people don't run as much or like it's kind of a, oh, I'm going to do this because it seems cool. Oh, yeah, and oftentimes who would win was whoever brought like the most beer to the barbecue or, or whatever, ha <laughs> whatever would happen. Okay, so Washington, though, is going to try to staff his army. And he's going to urge a certain type of individual to be an officer, a general. And, and nowadays, you've heard me ramble about this. Nowadays, every man is a general. But in the 18th century, it meant something different. It meant a man of honor, so a man of reputation, a man of morality, a man of bravery and valor. And Washington's saying, if you're a gentleman, a man of honor in civilian life, we can translate that to the military. Um, because America doesn't have a military academy. They don't have a professional army. So who are your officers? Who are your soldiers? Just regular people. Um, no formalized training. Yeah, some had fought in the French Indian War, some had dealt with sort of native raids, but, but very sort of limited overall. So here are the British trapped in Boston. And uh, you'll note on the map here the British forever retreating in this, in this depiction. And any of these elevated positions, um, you'd have American uh, colonial, excuse me, uh, continental army cannons, and they force the British out through bombarding certain areas. And the British are going to evacuate Boston. Um, and the date of that was actually two days ago, uh, March 17th. So here's a big overarching map of the campaign. So the war is going to go from 1775 to 1783, technically the last major battles in 1781. And if you are the British, what are your tactics here? How are you going to beat the Americans? Numbers. Yeah. What was that? Numbers. Numbers. OK. Superior army, hands down. You want to snuff them out, like get them to quit, like cut them off okay. from the rest of the world. Cut them off. How do you cut them off from the rest of the world? The Navy. There you go. You're going to blockade the coast. And then the British are going to make another tactical decision. And they believe that since the war has begun in Massachusetts, if you cut off Massachusetts, what could you stop? OK, so how do you cut off Massachusetts? You like create like a border almost. You cut them off from the ocean, and you okay. basically block them. You blockade them, and? Um, don't you blockade the Hudson? Yeah. Right? You take New York, go up the Hudson, and you can split them off. Now, this is one of the worst kept military secrets. <laughs> Washington knows they're going to attack there. The British know they're going to attack there. So why attack there? It's the only thing they can do. Well, it's the British know they have a good shot here. Mm -hmm. It's a harbor. They can use their navy. Washington, is, in a lot of ways, is reluctant to defend this. But the Continental Congress says, no, you must. Because what is the basic obligation of government? To protect its citizens. There you go. And if they don't do it, then they are, they are failing, just as the British had, in attacking their citizens, in, literally, at Lexington and Concord. Um, the Declaration of Independence is read right before the, the Battle of Brooklyn, Battle of Long Island. Um, and these are the reasons they're, they're giving, some of the chief reasons for breaking away from Britain. That the king, he, George III, has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. So how do you split with the king? Yeah, break up letter, because he's no longer your king. He's done something wrong. At the same time, the Americans are taking issue with the conduct of the war. Particularly, uh, the British are going to hire mercenaries, commonly known as Hessians. Um, so they're from a German state, a uh, state of Hesse Cassel. And the popular belief is they're sort of mercenaries fighting just purely for money. They're actually um, the army of Hesse Cassel that are rented out by their prince. So they are fighting for their regular wages their regular position. It's just the prince of Hesse Cassel that's actually cashing in on this. So um, Battle of New York does not go well. In fact, it is uh, numerous retreats. So here's Washington's retreat from Long Island uh, to Manhattan Island. Again, uh, Extremely difficult moving an army across any body of water, but Washington proves quite successful. The British are easily going to take New York, and again, the Continental Army is forced to retreat, literally crossing the bluffs of the Palisades. Traditionally, 
A major defeat like this would be crushing to, to a war, crushing to a commander. But it's how Washington interprets this and how Washington uses this to fundamentally change the way we look at the military and warfare. And how does he do that? Well, he studies. Washington's going to complain about his defective education for his whole life. He never went to formal schooling. So how do most American officers learn to become officers? Yeah, you have a handful like Charles Lee or Horatio Gates that have been trained by the British. How do most learn? Yeah, they get a book. Okay, so two of your most successful generals, Henry Knox and Benedict Arnold, American hero, <laughs> up until a certain time anyway, both sold books. So how do they, making it a little simplistic, uh, Henry Knox becomes the head of artillery because he read a book on it. So they're in many ways self-taught, so they're going to these military texts to learn how to be officers and soldiers. And uh, religion, upon which true honor is founded, the idea that there's an ethical basis in the military, this concept of honor. Um, honor consists in the constant practice of virtue and the duty of a soldier is honorable and honest were properly performed. The idea that if you act well in a battle or in a campaign, that you are doing your duty, you can receive honor. It used to be that honor was only for the victor. Uh, James Wolfe, who had uh, been a British general that actually died during the, the um, French Indian War in uh, Quebec, is going to say also the character of your army. He doesn't want a drunken, vicious, irregular army. It's but a poor defense to a state. But the virtue, courage, and obedience in the troops are a sure guard against all assaults, assaults to uh, execute their part with honor and spirit. So why don't you want a drunken, vicious army uh, raping, pillaging, and brutalizing? Okay. Because you can't organize them and they can't maintain order. So okay. what's the point? Yeah, if they can't maintain order, that fundamentally breaks down the military. And the revolution is about ideas. So who do you want on your side? Gentlemen. The gentlemen, certainly, but who else? You're fighting this war in America. Americans. Yeah, you don't want to upset the delicate balance between potential patriots, potential loyalists, or the you know, quote unquote neutrals. Frederick the Great, we read about him. Okay, so Frederick the Great, Prussian king, Prussian general. Uh, we focused on him before. And in this point, numbers are an essential point of war. And a general who loves his honor, his reputation, will always take extreme care to conserve and recruit his troops. The idea that they're taking, he's concerned with the well-being of his, the average soldier. So what's, what's so shocking about that, if you think about war, and the common soldier prior to this, whether it's in the British Army or any, or any pretty much European army, they were the dregs of society. They were the absolute lower classes. You joined the military because you had no other choice. And so they were viewed as expendable. So what is Frederick the Great doing here that's fundamentally different? He's talking about how like the numbers of your uh, army is really important because each individual each individual man could be the tipping point. Like, okay. like a single person could make you win or lose. Okay, so you're dependent on the conduct of your soldiers. And at the same time, for Washington, what happens if the army is defeated, if he loses too many men? The whole country. Just... Yeah, that's the revolution. War is over. This is what he has. Um, so there's an understanding of the, the soldiers are something different. Um, Humphrey Bland, who's another British general, again, is going to publish a book that the Continental Army takes seriously. Uh, when an officer has had the misfortune of being beat, his honor won't suffer by it, provided he has done his duty and acted like a soldier. Okay, you're going to lose. At some point, an officer will lose. And it shouldn't be that officers are chasing victory or chasing the potential of victory. So long as they put in a valid effort when the odds make sense, they can be honorable. They are performing their duty. And Washington is literally going to relay this to uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, general and his sort of pseudo son, when he says, no rational person will condemn you for not fighting with the odds against you, and while so much of it depending on it, but all will censure a rash step if it is not attended with success. So what is Washington getting at here? Basically, it's okay like if you don't, like if you decide not to make like if the odds are against you, don't do it. But if um, you have a small chance that the odds are with you and you just brush it, 
then it's... Yeah, you, you have an obligation to preserve the army. And some of it is about maintaining the army in the field because the revolution will, will stay alive. Some of it is protecting the men. There's not the complete rank difference that you'd see in the British Army where you still have aristocracy. There's less sort of difference between your gentleman officer and, and your, your soldier. So Washington's going to use, again, going back to this, what are called Fabian tactics. Um, so this is the Roman general Fabius. And they're classic defensive tactics that are first employed against uh, Carthage uh, in the classical era. And Fabian strategy, which we talked about long, long ago, um, involves a defensive war, also known as a war of posts. So a defensive war implies fighting when it makes sense for you, forcing the enemy to act. So Washington's only going to fight when it makes sense for him. Otherwise, he's going to retreat. He's literally going to retreat from New York through New Jersey. And uh, he's going to have the British chasing him, particularly uh, General Charles Cornwallis, who you may remember from such films as The Patriot. Um, he also plays Ben Franklin in the John Adams miniseries. Anyway, um, he actually refers to Washington as the fox. And he treats it that this is a game, this is a hunt, and he is literally hunting Washington. And Washington is literally running and hiding. So he's using these Fabian tactics, not out of cowardice. He's using it because... He wants to maintain the army. And then when the situation is in his favor, such as here, crossing the Delaware, he's able to spring these, these very elaborate, difficult, uh, silent night crossings of river, rivers, the Delaware, and attacking uh, Hessians and, and winning successful battles, keeping and preserving the war, giving the Americans this big moral boost at a time when... when favor in the war is, is, is waning and commissions are running out. Um, and it's from fighting this war of posts, fighting in defensive ways rather than being just ultra aggressive. So the idea of uh, the older model of attack, attack, attack. And Washington's going to view the army very differently. And he's going to say, I should hope every post would be deemed honorable, which gave a man opportunity to serve his country. And by this, he doesn't, he means soldiers, yes, he means officers, he means anyone can serve. He also expands it to anyone that's aiding the, the, um, the military. And that could be civilians um, providing food or clothing. It could be women taking up collections to feed the army. It could be uh, even African Americans who are joining the army to serve in, in a variety of capacities. And expands the definition of, of who is a gentleman. We've said that gentleman was a really hierarchical term. But as early as 1775, so right at the start of the war, we have a new term uh, created. It's called the gentleman soldier. And uh, it's being done in, in sermons. It's being used for the Continental Army. It's being used for the militias, which are, are fundamentally different. You're still sort of National Guard uh, units of, of local uh, men in the 16 to 60 range. That gentlemen soldiers exhibit good conduct and noble character. Think of that word noble as if birth um, in the service of their country. So they become honorable. They become these gentlemen by serving their nation. It's duty to the nation rather than to a king um, or to a, a lord, as we've talked about in, in earlier sort of time periods. Every soldier should be a gentleman. Uh, how do they advance? Merit. And if you'll recall back to the French and Indian War, the Virginia militia under Washington had started to promote based on merit rather than based on, on sort of status. Um, and soldiers have to regard their duty to be sort of uh, become honorable. It doesn't say they have to be, have to be victorious. And this is carried on to other officers, General Anthony Wayne, um, again, another officer in Maryland, John Eager Howard, the idea that honor is for soldiers it's for officers, and it's not just for the individual. So how a person acts reflects their officers. So how you would behave would reflect your colonel or your general, and also the nation. Meanwhile, we do have African-American soldiers, uh, both free and enslaved. So does anyone know the first battle that African-Americans fought in in the American Revolution? Trivia question. They are, there are African Americans at Bunker Hill, but they're even earlier. Lexington. Lexington. So Lexington conquered and Bunker Hill. Uh, in fact, the Massachusetts ranks were, were, not, were, were not segregated. 
And these are free African Americans who had fought. And initially, Washington's really resistant, as, as are, is the Continental Army, as are his sort of other uh, council of generals. And he initially forbids enlistment of either not just enslaved, but also free African Americans. Um, he's ultimately going to move back. Uh, he's going to allow free African Americans and then ultimately enslaved African Americans. And the question is, well, why the change? Now, two schools of thought. One is the pragmatic. Uh, the British, under Lord Dunmore, who is the royal governor of Virginia, is going to issue a proclamation providing freedom for any slave who fights against uh, uh, the colonists. And Washington is shocked, as are all other slaveholders, and they, they resp Washington's ultimately respond with the same offer. So is this about men? Is this just about combating this? The other possibility is maybe he has a change of heart when he starts getting reports like these. So um, talk about Salem Poor, who's a veteran of the sort of campaigns in and around Boston. Uh, he's a character of so brave a man who behaved like an experienced officer as well as an excellent soldier. So not just a, any soldier, but as an experienced officer, so elevating an African-American soldier. Uh, General John Thomas is going to say they're equally serviceable with other men, not in other black men, but other men, all other men. And then in pension records, um, looking at sort of the conduct and, and sort of honorable nature. So it could be a little bit of both, but we do know there's roughly about 5,000 African Americans or, or so are going to serve in some capacity with the Continental Army ultimately offering freedom for, for service in the war. Meanwhile, things don't go so well uh, for Washington's army. In fact, in battles in and around Philadelphia, Washington's going to lose. And the capital is going to be occupied by the British Army. So this is one of the major low points of the war. And it forces, uh, it's going to force Washington to go on the, the defensive and the retreat again. Meanwhile, further north, the British have a plan. And it involves this man, Gentlemanly Johnny Burgoyne. Okay, so he gets the name Gentlemanly Johnny uh, because of his love of finery. He loved champagne. He loved fine clothes. Uh, he's said to be a ladies' man. And he was a playwright. So uh, the mission is for Burgoyne to march south from Canada and another British force to march north from New York City and go along the Hudson and cut off uh, New England. Problems with this are it's a long march through treacherous sort of terrain, mountains, uh, forests, and he has an exceptionally long baggage train, meaning he's lugging a lot of stuff. He has a car just dedicated to his champagne. Now, that may sound ridiculous, so why are you dragging your champagne through the woods of upstate New York, you may ask? It doesn't sound, it's not as ridiculous in the period, and that's because British officers, particularly generals of high rank, were expected to entertain their other officers, but also the officers' wives who would come on campaign. So they would stop and requisition a house, and they'd have a party. And if you can't throw these parties, it's, it's, it's really calling into question your sort of character. Um, so he's moving along, along with native allies. And the native allies are getting terrified of saying, this is not a good, this is not, not good tactically. We have to be aware of ambush. We have to, oh, nonsense. And they march further along. Ultimately, an uh, American army, continental army, uh, led by Horatio Gates, British trained officer, uh, also fought with Washington back in the French and Indian War, are going to manage to uh, cut off Burgoyne's army. And uh, Gates will say he single-handedly won the victory, but there's another man that says he single-handedly does it, and that is Benedict Arnold, American hero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Arnold, uh, despite def defying orders, uh, Horatio Gates and Arnold have had this ongoing feud um, about um, uh, command and rank. Largely, Arnold had been... Um, loyal to General Philip Schuyler. Uh, you probably remember his daughters from, again, another musical, mm -hmm. and Peggy. Um, and he's really resistant to Gates. Um, Arnold is actually going to be ordered by Gates to leave the battlefield, but he defies orders and single-handedly charges in and stops a potential retreat 
and he pushes it forward. And ultimately, there's a victory in Saratoga, and Arnold's going to be wounded. He's going to be shot in the leg, and he's going to fall back, and his horse is going to fall on top of him. And his men are going to rush to him and carry him off the field as if he was a Spartan soldier. And he's asked, uh, General, how are you? He goes, you're wounded in the leg. And he says, I had rather it been my heart. So he's looking for this glorious end, this romantic sort of classical death. Um, and had he died right there, he is probably one of the greatest American heroes of all time. So nowadays, if you go to the Saratoga battlefield, they just have a statue of his leg where he got shot. It's a patriotic leg. The rest of him is the problem. Um, so there is a surrender. Burgoyne surrenders this army, and it's a major turning point. Among other things, there's negotiations going on with France. And it proves to the French that the Americans could potentially win. And the French are willing to get into this war, um, sometimes for no other reason than they just don't like the British. Other reasons are they hope to gain back some of the land or they may have lost, they lost during the French and Indian War. So the, the French come in and there's an alliance formed, the peace, or excuse me, the Treaty of uh, 1778. Um, and it's an alliance between the, the Americans and the French. So the French are going to send money, supplies, ultimately an army. It's going to take a little bit. But more importantly, what is France's most important contribution to the American Revolution? Ah. Is it Louisiana? Oh, that's later. That's later. That's later. The Navy. The Navy. Because Ameri the American Navy cannot stand up to the British Navy. The, the French Navy is comparable in many respects. And this is what's going to cut off a lot of the, the, the British advantage. So, as news of Saratoga spreads, Washington is at the darkest period of the war. He's in Valley Forge encamped in snow, short on supplies, short on clothing. Meanwhile, Horatio Gates has won a grand victory. And Gates becomes the hero of the North. And he starts potentially conspiring. Washington is just lost. Washington has just allowed the capital to fall. Maybe Washington isn't right to lead the army, some say. And this is going to be, during this period of victory in the North and defeat in and around Philadelphia, it's going to lead to an attempt to unseat Washington. Um, but before we come to this, uh, the winter encampment at Valley Forge is crucial. And one of the reasons it's crucial is armies in the 18th century don't fight in the wintertime. You'd have campaigning seasons. You fight in the spring or the fall or the summer, but not in the winter. So it's during the winter that the army is able to actually train itself. They've had a hard fight since this war began. And who helps train the army? Um, Washington also has them performing plays in their off time. Why not? You've got to do something extracurricular. It's this man, the Baron Friedrich von Steuben, or von Steuben, depending how you want to say it. And he's going to be responsible for bringing in a European sort of drill master's um, concept. The problem is he doesn't speak any English. And most Americans don't speak any German. So how he'd do it, he would create one model unit and he would just basically yell at them and berate them in German and scream at them and show them what to do. And then that one model unit would, would then show the other units what they needed to do. And it's in this unit by unit basis that the Continental Army was trained to fight like a European army. And through him, there's actually a creation of this, this regulation, which is basically a code of conduct and drill for the Continental Army. They create a book, as many of them had learned. So they're, they're sort of creating the basis of, of forming this sort of uh, European-style army. So here's just some images of, of von Steuben drilling. Meanwhile, back to conspiracy. It comes to be known as the Conway Cabal. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Um, so this man is uh, General Conway. He was Irish. Um, you had many foreigners join the Continental Army. The Congress would just sort of, ah, you have an accent. Here's a commission. Um, sort of they could, many Europeans could sort of embellish their military record, and you could rise very quickly in the war. Um, and here's Gates. Gates uh, and Conway, I mean, there's, there's questions of what actually transpires, but there is a potential attempt to maybe put Gates in command. 
based on his record. And it, it's largely was nothing, but the, pro, the thing is Washington believed it to be true. But he still trusted the civilian supremacy. Ultimately, though, um, this is sort of found out and, and, and Gates is sort of shamed and he has to sort of back away. Um, meanwhile, Charles Lee comes back. Where was Charles Lee? Well, he had been captured and he had been uh, a prisoner of the British Army where he may or may not have committed treason. Uh, in the late 19th century, a document was found that Lee had drawn up uh, a plan to sort of tell the British how they could defeat the Americans. The question is, was this done for false information or is he literally trying to betray the Americans? I leave it to you to judge. But no one knew it at the time. Lee returns and he's sort of just been out of touch. He's been a captive for two years. The war sort of passed him by. But he has been this sort of constant adversary of Washington. He's British trained. He has fought throughout Europe. And uh, this all comes to a head again at the Battle of Monmouth, which is in, in New Jersey. And Lee is given uh, command of the vanguard initially, which is a prestigious position, leading the, the army uh, at the front with orders to attack. And he turns it down. I shall not deign to accept that. So Washington appoints Lafayette. Lafayette accepts. Lee is now upset that a junior officer has been placed in command rather than him. And then he demands the position. So he accepts it. He marches out. And uh, his force is facing British grenadiers. And ultimately, he's under orders. Um, the question is, is it direct orders or implied orders? But the sense is he's supposed to attack. And he retreats instead. And Washington catches wind of this. It's actually a drummer. Um, who's running back, and Washington sort of grabs hold of him. He's like, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know, sir. We're retreating. What do you mean? And Washington charges forward, and he gets, runs into a retreating Lee, and he says to Lee, what are you doing, sir? You know, paraphrasing a bit. He says, um, 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 your excellence, uh, um, and he calls him, you damn poltroon. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? means you damn coward publicly. And there's all sorts of these mythical languages that the trees shook at the sound of Washington swearing. And Anyway, uh, Washington relieves him of command and personally charges in, writing a potential uh, uh, retreat. And this basically stops any sort of challenges to Washington. There's sort of a political side to him also. Um, Lee is going to actually demand a court-martial saying that his honor has been infringed on. He's been insulted by Washington. But the court-martial finds in Washington's favor, finds against Lee. So Lee starts publishing all sorts of pamphlets how he's been wronged. He actually challenges a woman to a duel. Um, uh, in jest, she, he says that she got the color of his pants wrong in her account. So therefore, what else did she get wrong? Uh, there ultimately is going to be a real uh, duel. Um, fought to defend Washington, though Washington is, is fervently opposed to this. But it's basically the end of Charles Lee, and it's basically the end of any sort of uh, push against Washington. The French are ultimately going to arrive under the General Rochambeau and the Admiral de Grasse, and this is going to, again, aid the Continental Army immensely in, in, in not just men, but, but uh, equipment, training. Um, Meanwhile, Philadelphia is going, the British are going to evacuate Philadelphia. It had been under occupation. Now, the question is, who is going to be placed in command there? Perhaps a recovering battlefield hero, known for his gallantry and his selling of books, Benedict Arnold. So Benedict Arnold's recovering, and he's given this really prestigious command. Arnold doesn't want it. He's a battlefield commander. He wants to, to fight, but he's, he's not ready yet. So he's given this position, it's prestigious, yeah, yeah, he accepts it. The problem is Arnold's really full of himself, and he talks a lot, and he talks too much, and he runs his mouth. Congress does not like him. He feels he's constantly passed over by other lesser officers, inferior officers that have been promoted over him. And He's been brought up on charges before, sort of using government property, pillaging, uh, some other charges that no one knows about until after the war. And it's 
Uh, he's placed in charge here. But the Congress demands he swear an oath of loyalty to, him, to them first. And Arnold is disgusted. How dare you? Look what I've given to this country. So he'll only take it to his friend, another officer, Henry Knox. So Arnold is uh, set up as military governor. And how does, what is his first act? Well, he throws himself a party where he invites no members of the Continental Army. And he ends up marrying, who's right there in the corner, Peggy Shippen, who is a, from a loyalist family. And it's through her that he may or may not make the acquaintance of a British a uh, major named John Andre, and potentially start a correspondence that will ultimately lead to treason. Uh, Arnold obviously uh, gives himself the code name of Gustavus, after who we read earlier, Gustavus Adolphus, famed sort of Swedish king in general. Meanwhile, the British have a new plan. Go south, young man. See, I'm co-opting. Anyway. Um, so, go, so the British are going to turn their attention to the South. They're constantly chasing loyalists. They feel that if they can link up with sort of loyalists in America, it will help turn the tide of the war. Um, they really have faulty intelligence, some even dating back to you know, 1774 from Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson, that, that it's really only a few rabble-rousers. It's most of the colonies, it's colonies aren't, aren't for this. Um, so this could be uh, who's going to be sent is Charles Cornwallis, and uh, from Charleston he's going to push through in South Carolina. And the idea is to march north. Um, who's first in command uh, during the early days, particularly at the Battle of uh, Camden, is going to be Horatio Gates, the great Northern hero, goes south, and it's at the, uh, this crushing defeat at the Battle of Camden that Gates is going to retreat. Uh, some reports say 180 miles further than his army. How does he do that? He literally runs away, runs from the British. It's actually about 70 miles. But this is basically the end of Horatio Gates uh, because of it's viewed as cowardly. It's viewed as ineffective. This is, this is just proving everything um, that was sort of uh, in some ways duplicitous about the, the came out of the Conway cabal. And Alexander Hamilton, uh, who's Washington's aide-de-camp, is going to famously joke that he's not shocked that Gates actually did this, but that a man of Gates's age was physically capable of riding so far and so fast. Um, but so that's the end of Horatio Gates. Who's put in charge instead, and this is Cornwallis, is uh, General Nathaniel Green. And he's from Rhode Island, and he's what we call a fighting Quaker, uh, meaning he's a Quaker. Uh, Quakers are usually pacifists against war, but he was very much in favor of sort of uh, resistance, fighting the sort of defensive war. And he's going to be your chief general in the, in the southern campaigns. And the south is, particularly on the sort of frontier, is going to be very much dictated by partisan fighting. Um, and by that, I mean sort of loyalist versus patriot. So uh, not necessarily traditional Continental Army or British regular army, but different bands of loyalists. So this is where you get Mel Gibson and the Patriot, or if you go to the older Disney movies like the Swamp Fox, fighting in these sort of guerrilla styles. Um, and it makes it very difficult oftentimes to know who is who. And it also leads to heightened degrees of atrocity in cases, where you have uh, brutal reprisals against loyalists and patriots, and in one uh, case, you have one commander, Griffith uh, Rutherford, uh, who's in this sort of frontier, this Carolina frontier area, um, for news reaches Nathaniel Green of potential um, violations of, of, of harm coming to loyalist women and children in their homes and their property. And he is denouncing this fervently, saying, this is not the war we're fighting. We're fighting a war based on principle, a war of ideology, a war that showed that we are behaving better. We are ethical. We have honor. The British do not. Proper treatment of, of prisoners, proper treatment of civilians. And this is something that Washington has advanced. Um, it comes to be known, uh, sort of highlighted by, again, this individual, Bannister Tarleton. Uh, he is a British officer. Uh, he's Tavington in The Patriot. You may know him. He's in, also in Harry Potter. Uh, no, it's not Alan Rickman. Uh, Jason Isaacs. 
blonde hair, cane, snake, uh, whoever that is. Oh, Lucius. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> All right. Um, who also gets a start, just to show how, how uh, widespread this fighting is, is a young teenager, go on to become president, literally refuses, as legend says, to clean an officer's boot in Tarleton's regiment and gets a saber to the side of his head and vows to fight the British for the rest of his life. Anyone? Jackson. Andrew Jackson. So you have all sorts, uh, all different ages fighting and engaged in, in, in combat. Meanwhile, further north, whispers, plotting. After Philadelphia, uh, Arnold is ready to return to command. And uh, he'd been brought up on court-martial charges while in, in Philadelphia, and he'd been found guilty. And his reprimand was relatively light, a public censure from Washington that basically boiled down to, we had wished General Arnold's conduct would not have included this and will change in the future. Little light tap. Arnold is furious. His last protector, Washington, has betrayed him. America has offended his honor. He is lost to all. So he's going to plot to make a daring change uh, defect to the British. and He's going to angle to be placed at West Point. So West Point, before it's a military academy, was a fort. And uh, Washington's sort of shocked by this because he knows Arnold wants to fight in battle. Why does he want an a, a outpost? But he agrees. And West Point is crucial for this right here. And it's along the Hudson. And what that is is literally a chain, a big, thick chain, about like this thick, that just stretches across the Hudson River. What do you think it's meant to do? Keep out ships. Keep out ships. Literally tear the hulls open. Would it work? What do you think? I say no. Okay. Anyone say yes? So, bottom line, no one knows because it was never tested. So you have batteries on either side of cannon. So the British never tested it. But if West Point falls and the chain and the garrisons and batteries are removed, what can the British do? The Take the Hudson and therefore divide the colonies, which they've been trying to do. So Andre, uh, this is his self-portrait. Again, he's a very fashionable gentleman. Um, is going to arrange to meet with Arnold, and they're going to do it under secret. Now, the thing is, Andre is a British major. He's uh, an aide to General Clinton. And... He, well, Arnold wants to meet with him, but he wants to meet with him on past American lines. Now, if a British officer in his red coat was meeting with Benedict Arnold, the commander uh, in West Point, that would look a little suspicious, don't you think? So he tells Andre to take off his uniform. Problems. What happens the moment he takes off that red coat? He's a spy. So ultimately there's correspondence, and Andre is caught by a roving band of, um, by these sort of roving militiamen. There's questions long term of, are they loyal? Are they of questionable loyalty? There's some argue that they're just sort of brigands or, um, but anyway, they become celebrated initially as these great heroes. And, and Andre, unfortunately, identifies himself as Major John Andre of his king's forces. And, um, these sort of shocking uh, display that, whoa, they're not British. Um, Loyalists. So uh, Arnold is discovered. Uh, Andre is ultimately going to be hanged as a spy. But Washington, the Continental Army, uses this this great moment. Um, there had been waning difficulty between the uh, Continental Army and the civilian population at this point, where the army had been complaining, well, the civilian population isn't supplying the army properly. Where's the food? Where's the, the clothing? Or if it was, it was being sent at exponentially high prices, so war profiteering. Meanwhile, the civilians were saying, how come you haven't won this war? You let the capital fall. You haven't been winning. But it's this moment that sort of shocks all of America together. It's a moment like 9-11 or Pearl Harbor that sort of brings everyone back. And the question is why? 
And it's sort of this galvanizing moment. So uh, George Whedon, the general, is going to say, if we have not virtue enough among ourselves to check Mr. Arnold without losing sight of the grand object, we ought to suffer. Meaning that we need to rise above this. If we cannot, we will lose, and we should lose. Washington's going to spin it. And he's going to say, this is a great thing. How is this a great thing? Because it's never happened before. How dedicated are Americans that this is the first instance of its kind when you know, more were to be expected? And, and this proves the value of the army, proves the value of the devotion to the cause. Um, and within a year, we have a march on, on Yorktown, which is going to be the major final battle. And what's going to happen is Cornwallis is going to move himself further north into Virginia on a peninsula. Uh, we've talked about this before. Why do you not want to put yourself on a peninsula if you're an army? Only one way out. So why does Cornwallis do it? Okay, he thinks the Navy can, can aid him and he can retreat via the Navy. But through a quick march, uh, a late march of the French and Americans jointly, they are going to uh, surround Cornwallis on the peninsula. And the French Navy is going to cut off the British Navy. So you're literally going to have a siege of Yorktown um, where you could have siege works built. And Cornwallis is, is, doesn't have a way out. And he's going to be forced to surrender. And the British band plays the song, The World Turned Upside Down. That this is the last major battle of the revolution. It will carry on for, for a couple more years, but this is it. And why do the British stop fighting? Why do you think? Why do they stop fighting? They could continue this war. There's still a full army in New York. There was nobody left that was loyal to them in the country. Okay, so you still have loyalists, but you, you now have to not only defeat the army, you have to win over the hearts and minds of, of Americans. And, 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 and that's problematic. It's too expensive. Yeah, this is costly. Um, wasn't there also there was issues in France? Were oh, okay, issues France. so now by this point the French are in, uh, the Spanish are in, the Dutch are financing the Americans. This has become a, a world war in many respects or at least a, a expanded European war. Um, it's not in the best interest. Um, so um, Yorktown is going to be the last major battle. There could be small skirmishes here and there. And what Green, Nathaniel Green in particular is going to be worried about is sort of a, a lone sort of figure uh, carrying on and going past some going past the terms of duties like a Griffith Rutherford or like an Arnold, uh, exceeding what they should be doing and dragging sort of the, the conduct of the war downward. But um, as peace starts coming to an end, rumors start circulating of a peace. And Washington has one last battle to fight. And it's, within, it's with his own officers. So this is uh, Newburgh, New York. It's not far from West Point. It's along the Hudson. The British Army is still in New York City. And they'll remain there until after the war. And the Continental Army is sort of checking them and watching over them. And the problem was the officers had not been paid. Well, why hadn't they been paid? Anybody? Yeah, they don't have any money. <laughs> they have pretty much worthless Continental dollars. Um, they had also been promised half pay for life. So a pension. Problems? Same one as before. It's a lot of money. Yeah, and Congress doesn't have it. So there's rumblings. Um, especially if a peace comes, what do you think these officers are afraid of? They don't have any other means of getting money. Yeah, that they're not needed. Or if they were injured in the war, they can't work anymore. Well, yeah, that they're not needed. And the Congress may never pay them. So in what comes to be known as the Newburgh Conspiracy... Uh, or the Newburgh Affair, depending on how you want to term it. Um, Continental officers are going to secretly meet, and two things they're going to discuss. One, potentially a coup on Congress, take over Congress until they get paid. Or two, retreat behind the mountains. What mountains? Those mountains. And let the British march out of New York City and do what? Take back. Whatever. Whatever. Until, uh, until Congress pays them. Fundamentally, both of these are problematic. And fundamentally, both of these ideologically go against the, the, the American Revolution. So what Washington's going to do to show he's in charge is cancel their meeting and call his own meeting. You can't meet. 
You're going to meet with me instead. He didn't sound like that, but he might have. And he's going to appeal to them based on uh, what comes to be known as the Newburgh Address. And he's going to use these words, and let me conjure you in the name of, the co- of, your, of our common country as you value your own sacred honor to express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes under any specious pretenses to overturn the liberties of our country. March 15th, that was only four days ago. So what is Washington saying here? Yeah, you're just honoring not just yourself, the country. What have we fought for? What have we fought? What will this become? And he uses the term sacred honor. Aside from me babbling about honor, I mean, where have we seen this word, these two words? Well, I bet you all have. Trivia. Mm-hmm. Like American texts? Yeah. The Declaration of Independence, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Washington purposely using words from the Declaration to link this back. Civilian supremacy, the ideals of the revolution over the needs of the individual, sort of the greater good of society, Um, saying that it's about the country. Think of what we've accomplished. This has never been done before. And you're going to give it up? So what usually happens after a civil war or, or a rebellion or a, some sort of conflict like this? How do they usually end? If you think about in the classical era or in English civil war, what usually happens? Usually, yeah, like a treaty or a contract. Okay. Cease arms. Okay. And who takes control? Another king. Uh, uh, maybe a king or from where's this, this new ruler king come from? Yeah, so think about Oliver Cromwell in the English Civil War, or Julius Caesar, or later on, Napoleon. You have this military sort of figure seizing power. And Washington, this will not happen. So ultimately, um, uh, this is going to appeal to them. And Washington also does a sort of personal thing. And he's got actually a letter he's going to read. And um, Washington uh, has been losing his eyesight. And most people don't know this, but he wore glasses. But he doesn't want anyone to see them because they're not cool. Uh, but also it's the sign of he didn't want to show weakness. So what he does is he pulls them out and he puts them on and he, 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 said, he reminds them of what he's given, that he's also given his sight. And the sort of the officers start crying and then they sort of embrace this as Washington showing this, this sort of humility and this weakness, but basically this appeal to their ideals. And, and, and the revolution is preserved, and the army comes out as, as champions of, of liberty. But the last act, and probably the most important in American history, in, in my opinion, and certainly the last, one of the, the last major acts of the Continental Army is this. It's in Annapolis in December 1783. Peace has been announced in Washington, is going to surrender his commission as commander-in-chief to the Continental Congress. Now, what is, so, what is so different? What is so shocking about this? Okay. Because everyone thought that he would be sort of something like, in a position, something like the king, you know, because that's kind of where we came from, basically. Okay, so the, the, the sense that this has always result, resulted in some sort of, of right, whether it's a dictator, a king, an emperor, a lord protector, whatever they want to call themselves. This never ends well. And Washington is literally giving up power. I mean, this is a man who would not be king. Um, and this is where we actually get the, the term. Uh, George III, uh, so over in England, King George III, actually uh, is expecting Washington to name himself king. Why? Because that's what he understands. What, what he's go, so he's ultimately going to be told that Washington is actually giving up power. And he, he's shocked. And he stops and he says, well, then if he does that, then he shall be the greatest man in the world. Dramatic pause. Um, so the I, and that's what I'm writing my new book on, among other things. Um, but the idea of this is what seals Washington's sort of immortality. He gets compared to the American Cincinnatus. And we, we talked about Cincinnatus, the Roman. Well, 
I guess in January, maybe? So Cincinnatus had briefly been granted dictatorial powers of Rome. And what did he do? Gave it back and returned to his farm. And then we said became Russell Crowe. Um, so gladiator, loosely, Cincinnatus-like. Um, so Washington surrenders his commission here. And this preserves civilian supremacy. And it maintains for all after that the army serves the civilian government. It won't be a dictatorship. It wouldn't be a monarchy. It would be civilian controlled. It would embrace the ideals of the revolution. Um, and this moment, in a lot of ways, proves that the ideals that the Continental Army was based on actually held. Um, and, and that's what's so profound and so different in the history of sort of warfare when we're looking at, at, at armies prior to the Continental Army and then those after the Continental Army, that we see sort of ideological focus. We see it again later in the French Revolution as well, but we still see in the French Revolution the rise of Napoleon. We still see these failings. We still see revolutions and civil wars that fall to these sort of strong men or generals that seize power. But it's Washington, who's the, since the classical era, the first to do it, and one of the few individuals to, to actually do it at all. So let's end there for today. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. at midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.